Okay, we should be live now. Do I see an icon? Uh, Mate, uh huh. Okay, thanks. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rokrans, and I'll be the host for today for our fourth installment of our series of online talks convened yeah, by be... Mladi za podnebno pravičnost, or Youth for Climate Justice, Slovenia, a grassroots activist movement. We hope to dedicate these sessions to a broader, more general audience, and together with invited guests, use this current situation, for lack of a better uh, word, uh -huh. as a point okay, of thanks. departure for collective sense -making. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rob and I'll in be the host for today. To build for the our fourth installment of our series of online capitalism for ourselves, each other, future generations, and those considered non human others, and to co create the conditions and structures for co creating just futures. And I'm very, very happy to be welcoming three guests today. This will be Dan, uh, Brian, and Gideon. And uh, instead of me kind of assigning you all sorts of signifiers and, and what you did and, and such, I thought maybe it would be best to hear it straight from the horse's mouth uh, from, from all of you and uh, kind of your backgrounds and your relations to each other. And yeah, well, I guess I'll, I'm scheduled to go first. I'm Dan Chodorkoff. Uh, I co-founded the Institute for Social Ecology in 1974 with a man named Murray Bookchin, who's really a seminal figure in the modern radical ecology movement. Uh, I have a PhD in cultural anthropology. My background is really in uh, urban studies and utopian studies. And I've been involved with the Institute ever since its formation. I, I, what I want to do today is just give you a brief, very brief introduction to social ecology. I suggest if it sparks your interest, I think that Brock has provided some other resources, a talk that I did in Slovenia a few years ago and a brief article of mine that also provide an overview. Given the time constraints today, I'm, I'm going to take about 15 minutes now and I'll do what I can, but please accept that it's gonna be a very kind of broad overview and certainly should be provocative enough to raise questions that we'll try to address later. I'm really pleased to be here today with Gideon and Brian. Brian is a longtime colleague at the Institute. He's currently our director. He's worked with us for close to 40 years at this point. And Gideon, I got to know a little when he came to study at the Institute for a couple of years uh, back in the 80s, I believe it was. So we're, we're all longtime comrades and we've been through a lot together over the years. I think what we're facing today though is really unprecedented in the sense that we're seeing uh, this virus, this plague that's really engulfing the planet emerging at a time that really highlights the larger ecological context in which it has emerged. And that's something that social ecology has tried to address uh, ever since Bookchin really formulated the basic ideas back in the 1950s. Essentially, social ecology is a philosophy. It's a system of inquiry that tries to untangle people's relationship to the natural world. And we do that on a number of levels. It's an interdisciplinary perspective that draws on philosophy, on anthropology, history, sociology, uh, very importantly on the biological sciences and particularly ecology and tries to understand the ways in which social relations have really shaped our relationship to the natural world. Social ecology puts forward the notion that there really is no such thing as an environmental problem, that really all of the various crises that we face from global warming to the coronavirus <coughs> social problems, and that they are largely an outgrowth. Our attempt to dominate nature and the problems that that has created are largely an outgrowth of 
the kind of domination that exists in society today. So social ecology really posits uh, the broad categories of hierarchy and domination as essential to any analysis that is adequate when we're looking at ecological issues. And ultimately, of course, that leads us to a critique of capitalism. We see that capitalism is inevitably going to create these kinds of crises because it's a system that use unbridled growth and the acquisition and utilization of resources, which is really the category that nature is subsumed to under capitalism, uh, as ultimately coming up against ecological limits. And for social ecology, that's the real crisis of capitalism when it comes up against <clears throat> ecological limits. In social ecology, we begin with a philosophical inquiry. We first take an epistemological approach and try to define nature. Social ecology sees nature in a way which is really quite different from the traditional Western model of the dualistic thinking, the Cartesian way that we look at nature as a mechanism, nature as something external to humanity. Rather, we understand that nature and people are part of the same phenomena, but we also see gradations, unlike certain Eastern philosophies, which make and see nature as an undifferentiated whole. Social ecology thinks it's very important that we understand various aspects of nature. And Bookchin talked about first nature, which he saw as natural evolution and natural history. That's really how social ecology defines nature as a process, as an ongoing development. Uh, and he made a distinction between first nature, which is nature as it evolves without the influence of humanity and second nature. He saw people, humanity as an integral part of first nature, yet also as distinct. And I think the major distinction we can make here is that in first nature, uh, evolution occurs largely through an adaptation of various species to particular environmental niches. And when second nature enters the picture, we begin instead to adapt the environment to meet our needs. And at this point, I think it's undeniable that second nature has extended its influence uh, throughout the whole of the planet, the whole globe. There's no place on earth that hasn't been affected by humanity. You can look at the South Pole, the North Pole, the most remote portions of the globe and we'll find uh, elevated mercury levels, we'll find the effects of global warming, which is certainly a result of human activity. And all of this indicates then that we are inextricably linked with second nature, with first nature, and that second nature is in fact in a mutualistic relationship, ideally at least with first nature. And out of all of that, of course, Bookchin saw merging the third nature as people become self-conscious, self-aware, understand the underlying science that generates species, that creates the world around us. Uh, as we gain that self-consciousness, we can ultimately become nature itself rendered self-conscious, nature aware of itself. And then we can begin to reharmonize our relationship with the natural world. And ultimately, that's the goal of social ecology. Social ecology is not just an academic discipline. It's really a praxis in which we take our ideas and we try to apply them in the world. Then we come back, look at the effects of our actions, revise our theories in relation to that, and go out in the world to act again with the intent really being the reharmonization of people and nature and the emergence of a third nature or free nature. Social ecology after its epistemological turn uh, begins to develop an ethics and those ethics are derived from our understanding of certain processes, certain tendencies within natural evolution itself. Among those are the notion that nature, first nature is non-hierarchical uh, the understanding that unity emerges from diversity in ecosystems, that the greater the number of species interrelating at various trophic levels, the more stable that ecosystem is, the more able it is to withstand fluctuations, declines, even extinctions. 
uh, because there are other species which will fill that niche and maintain the stability of that system. And that's a third point that nature is homeostatic. It is stable, but it's not static. It is in fact in constant development. There are ebbs and flows, there's birth, death, decomposition, and all of that lends to the stability of the natural world. Ecosystems, when they are healthy, have the ability to maintain harmony and balance through those processes of change. And another very important principle that we derive from our understanding of nature is that in natural evolution, there is in fact a movement towards ever greater complexity, diversity, and a movement towards freedom, understanding freedom as self-consciousness, self-awareness, the ability to make choices. And within nature too, within the evolutionary process, we see that spontaneity plays a very important role. So social ecology tries to extract these tendencies from our understanding of natural evolution. This is of course, fits into a, a neo-Darwinian model of evolution. And from there, we try to apply those in the realm of human society so that we have an ethical framework which actually lines up with the processes which function within an evolutionary framework. And it's by applying those ethics that we think we can begin to reharmonize our relationship with the rest of nature. Social ecology then takes those ethics and applies them through creating a politics, which is an expression of those ethics. So our politics then are non-hierarchical. Our politics strive towards unity and diversity. They move towards ever greater complexity, diversity, and degrees of freedom. Uh, they are homeostatic and they are spontaneous to a degree as well. So we need to find forms in which we can institutionalize this ethical framework. And it finds expression, and to bring it down to very practical terms, through the politics of social ecology, which involves, of course, opposition, uh, traditional protest movements. We need to stop that dam from being built. We need to shut down the nuclear power plants. We need to end industrial pollution. We need to cut carbon out of our diet on this planet. Those are all concrete actions that can be taken through an oppositional process, through a process of protest, very immediate. Uh, secondly, we need to create alternatives. And that's a very important part of the politics of social ecology as well. We need economic alternatives. We need to create cooperatives and networks of cooperatives. We need to combat capitalism through the creation of a new society within the shell of the old. And in doing so, we will educate ourselves in the process of democratic decision-making, in the process of seeking consensus, in the process of community building. And these are all vitally important aspects of the process of political change. <clears throat> and finally, the third way in which those politics need to be developed and applied is through the creation of decentralized, locally-based forums for directly democratic decision-making which ultimately can begin to create a dual power that will challenge the state and challenge capitalism and offer a real true democratic alternative and ecological alternative for people. And at that point, then we can seize the means of production. We can municipalize those. We can create the preconditions for post-scarcity society, which reharmonizes people and the natural world. And that's really ultimately the project of social ecology. It is a revolutionary discipline in the sense that we feel in order to achieve ecological harmony, we really do need to first deconstruct and then reconstruct the basic institutions that inform our social life, our economic relationships, our political relationships, the way that we relate together in communities, we need to eliminate the kinds of hierarchy and domination, the kinds of sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, uh, all of the ills that we see in contemporary society, which are being exacerbated now uh, through this coronavirus 
crisis that we're in the midst of. We're seeing governments using this as an opportunity to consolidate control, to undermine all kinds of oppositional efforts, and to impose, quite frankly, what it appears to me to be a, a fascistic new regime. So all of these various elements are really tied together. And social ecology, I think one of the great strengths of social ecology is that it, it attempts to get to the root of the problem. We're not satisfied with putting band-aids on problems. We wanna rip off the band-aids. We wanna to get to the root. We wanna deconstruct and reconstruct those institutions, which ultimately are the source of our ecological problems today. And I guess given a 15 minute framework, that's about all I can say right now. I'll leave it at that and hopefully others will elaborate. We'll have time for questions and discussion. So thank you. And I do wanna thank uh, Rock and others in his group for organizing this forum. I think it's very important that particularly in the midst of the kind of enforced isolation that we find ourselves in today to continue these kinds of dialogues to create broader networks and to strengthen our movement and take this as an opportunity to maybe step back and reflect on what we're doing. Social ecology has a utopian perspective in the sense that we think in terms of not simply what is, but what could be and what should be. And it's a utopia which will be constructed from real existing potentialities, not from a cloud cuckoo land. And that's really the project that we're engaged in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, for that overview. Yeah, we'll be sure also to reference uh, uh, people who are watching and, and later on uh, to all the resources and also ask all of you to, to forward any other materials, although we've got some already. And I think it really encapsulated a lot of the dimensions we're trying to tackle and cover with, with this movement as well, these different layers. Maybe at this point, I would give the word to Brian uh, to, so he, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just give it to you also to maybe just introduce yourself in a minute and we can move on to presentation. Uh, you are muted, Brian. Okay, thank you. Um, I should also say <clears throat> at the outset that my image on the screen has been freezing a little bit and I've tried some different channels and I hope this will be stable. Uh, I wanna thank you, Rock, for inviting me to be part of this session. Uh, again, my name is Brian Tokar. I've been involved, as Dan mentioned, with the Institute for Social Ecology for most of the last 35 or 40 years. Uh, I'm also a lecturer in environmental studies at the University of Vermont, about an hour from here in Burlington. And I've been teaching and writing and engaged in many different uh, <clears throat> environmental and other social movements here in Vermont and elsewhere over the last many years. Um, I've written a number of books. Uh, a few years ago, I published this one. Uh, with some social ecology comrades in Norway toward climate justice. Some of what I'll be presenting today about what social ecology specifically contributes to the climate movement uh, is from a chapter I wrote for this book that came out last year. Um, and I've got a brand new book that just came out this week. I'm still waiting for my copy, but this is what the, the cover looks like just from my my quick printout of the proofs. It's an international collection uh, with 15 contributed chapters from around the world on a variety of grassroots climate responses. I wanna talk a little bit about how social ecology has contributed and is contributing to various movements in general, and also uh, focus in on spe some specific lessons for the climate movement. Um, as Dan mentioned, social ecology has a history going back to uh, some of Murray Bookchin's earliest writings in the 1960s at a time really before, their, before the first Earth Day, before there was anything that could be described coherently as an ecological movement. 
uh, Murray Bookchin wrote a, a pamphlet called Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, where he argued that there are qualities of what was then really just an emerging ecological consciousness that were fundamentally revolutionary and fundamentally reconstructed, pointing toward a vision of a very different kind of world than the highly polluted world most people in the global north were living in then. Uh, certainly we see it in uh, many global south cities today at an even, to an even more severe degree. And at the same time that social ecologists were engaged in those early ecological movements, uh, people were pioneering the earliest efforts to begin to green our cities, uh, develop methods of permaculture and uh, organic agriculture and other ways of participating with non-human nature in a cooperative and forward-looking way. Social ecology was very influential in the movements against nuclear power that reached their peak in both Europe and the US in the 1970s and early 80s, bringing notions of decentralized direct democracy, the prefigurative dimension of that movement that has carried on through many movements in uh, the ensuing decades. Social ecologists were active in the development of ecofeminism, uh, of green politics, focusing on a grassroots approach, a bottom-up approach to green politics, very different from the tendency that led in most countries toward the establishment of more conventional uh, kinds of political parties. Um, social ecologists were very active in the global justice movement that among other things succeeded in shutting down the World Trade Organization in Seattle just a little over 20 years ago, uh, bringing a tremendous revival of uh, movement interest in uh, opposition to capitalism as a system and the alternative of a politics of grassroots direct democracy, which of course evolved uh, many a couple of decades later into the Occupy movement, beginning with Occupy Wall Street in New York City, where again, many of our uh, social ecology colleagues were, were very active and part of the core group that really helped get that movement going. And then in recent years uh, here in the US and, and some other places, bringing our politics of direct democracy into efforts like opposition to genetically engineered agriculture, uh, and more recently uh, over the last decade, the movement for climate justice. So what does social ecology specifically offer to those movements and what are the lessons for today? Uh, first <clears throat> comes the, what's probably the most fundamental understanding that emerges from social ecology, which is that our environmental problems are fundamentally social and political in nature. Um, we tend to separate those spheres, especially in the mainstream of the environmental movement. And from its beginning, social ecology offered a fundamental critique of environmental business as usual, an understanding that capitalist growth is the most fundamental threat to the survival and the sustenance and the thriving of both our society and of uh, natural e ecosystems. Recent scholarship has really illuminated our understanding of the fundamental role of the fossil fuel industry in proliferating that myth of capitalist growth. Um, the ways in which uh, the shift back in the 19th century from uh, industries primarily on the run of riverways running on hydropower toward coal-fired steam engines that enabled capital, early capitalists to move their production into cities, greatly heightening their control over the workforce, which people like Andreas Malm have argued was the primary motive, and then um, facilitating uh, a system that adopted an ideology of, of 
of growth at all costs, which became fundamental to the sustenance of that system and is a, at the core of so many of the problems that we face today. Social ecology urges us to expose the origins and also the underlying structures of principles of hierarchy and domination that also are fundamental to the way our current society is organized and to the systems that we need to overturn. Uh, social ecology views the notion of humans dominating non-human nature as fundamentally mythical and as a direct outgrowth of the emergence of relationships of domination uh, in various key transitional moments in early human history. Social ecology illuminates the underlying roots and history of ecological radicalism. There are many currents that uh, today are very much complementary, but a lot of notions that uh, are taken for granted on the left of the environmental movement and even to some extent the mainstream of the environmental movement really were not being articulated until uh, Murray Bookchin and other social ecologists started making those arguments uh, in the 1960s and 70s. As Dan suggested, social ecology takes a dialectical approach to understanding natural evolution, argues that a particular kind of ethics can emerge from our understanding of tendencies in evolution that evolves into our approach to politics and how we make change. And central to that approach is of course the politics of direct democracy. Uh, we know from the current crisis that uh, as many commentators have suggested, the current epidemic raises the urgency of uh, a proactive and effective form of governance uh, at various levels, but we know <clears throat> that all forms of governance have the potential to become extremely authoritarian if they're not fundamentally popular and democratic at their roots and organize power and decision making from the ground up rather than the top down. Social ecology has always focused on the fundamental link between, as Dan also mentioned, our opposition movements and efforts to reconstruct a different world and looks forward toward uh, a longer range, more utopian outlook that pushes us beyond the constraints of the current system. Something that is sometimes difficult to do when we're in the midst of an emergency, but we know that decisions that we make today, that uh, activities that we undertake in this emergency uh, will very much shape the kind of future that uh, we will all find ourselves living in uh, once the current emergency passes. So what does, do those understandings specifically offer our current movements for climate justice? And in my writing on climate justice, I tend to focus on uh, the various elements that have contributed to the movement through its evolution over the last 10 or 20 years, particularly the contribution of indigenous and other land-based people's movements around the world that uh, started articulating uh, notions of climate justice uh, well before most climate activists in the North were aware of it, the central role of uh, what we know as the environmental justice movement that initially emerged mostly from communities of color in North America and spreading around the world with an understanding that people who have been marginalized are fundamentally more susceptible, more vulnerable to a wide array of environmental challenges and particularly uh, the problems that emerge from the climate crisis. We've been talking about uh, climate related uh, disasters of various kinds, extreme weather events uh, in 
North America and in Europe for a few years, but people in many parts of the world, particularly tropical and subtropical regions, have been experiencing those disruptions uh, for at least a couple of decades, and in some cases, longer than that. The other central element of climate justice, of course, is its focus on systemic critiques of the status quo and the need to understand the social and institutional roots of the climate crisis. And uh, many of the currents that feed the climate justice movement and, and further uh, discussions in that direction uh, come out of the global justice movement that challenged the World Trade Organization and other international financial institutions 20 years ago and social ecology's outlook on uh, understanding, again, the fundamentally social roots of environmental problems uh, have an important role in that discussion. Climate justice activists, including many, as many of us at the Institute, have been in the center of trying to expose many of the capitalist false solutions to the climate crisis, both technological false solutions, uh, which go back to uh, our roots in the anti-nuclear movement and, and other opposition movements, but also the critique of so-called market-based approaches uh, to uh, emissions reduction, the myths of carbon trading and carbon markets that have been so pervasive in the mainstream policy world uh, in many countries uh, speak to the dominance of capitalist ideology in many sectors of especially the climate policy world, but also to some extent the, the climate movement itself. The focus on linking our opposition to a longer range reconstructive vision of the future is central to the climate justice movement. Back a few years ago around the lead up to uh, the actions around the UN climate conference in Paris in 2015, there was a discussion about how to link our opposition to fossil fuel infrastructure uh, symbolized by the phrase blockadia, which was popularized uh, in Naomi Klein's book, but really goes back to the work of people that we collaborated with uh, in uh, Texas who were blocking uh, pipeline construction in the early 2010s, uh, the notion of <clears throat> geographic spaces of resistance that have emerged in many parts of the world. Uh, in resistance to fossil fuel infrastructure and merging that with a longer range ecological vision, which in the lead up to Paris was uh, <clears throat> symbolized by the, the French Basque framing Alternatiba, which was the name of actually a bicycle tour that surrounded the perimeter uh, of France, uh, stopping in communities that were especially engaged in various kinds of alternative building work. Um, notions of intersectionality, the way our various movements are linked by a, an understanding of the common roots of various forms of oppression and domination, of course, resonates with social ecology's understanding of the need to focus on hierarchy in general as a way of better understanding and better appreciating the connections between the very specific forms of oppression that uh, we experience in our daily lives. And then finally, the understanding that if we're going to see specific policy changes, that rather than uh, coming from the top down, those need to emerge from the understanding of our movements, from the experience of people who are most directly affected by those decisions. Uh, the movement for energy democracy, which uh, many progressive international trade unions have pioneered, is one example of that uh, out of many. So how do the kinds of changes that we need to see on a global scale emerge from these disparate local struggles? That's an important challenge, both for social ecology and for the climate movement. <clears throat> One way of 
describing that that I've just come across recently that I find very compelling is a, a phrase coined by the pioneering uh, anthropologist Arturo Escobar, who credits social ecology with an approach of radiating horizontalism outward from many distinct and unique centers of activity around the world as an alternative to the kinds of centralizing tendencies that many people uh, say are necessary if we're going to extrapolate from our local struggles to broader global changes. Can we instead think about radiating, radiating horizontalism outward from many centers? Um, one example of that, since we just uh, celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day in 1970, is to understand how the pioneering uh, environmental legislation of the 1970s uh, really happened in the US. It's not because a benevolent federal government uh, woke up one day and saw millions of people in the streets on Earth Day and lo and behold adopted legislation to uh, protect the air and the water and endangered species and all the rest. It's because cities and states and towns all over the US in the late 1960s in response to the extremes of pollution that people were living with at the time, uh, passed their own laws, their own local ordinances, uh, were engaged in lawsuits against polluting corporations, and a consensus emerged where the elites in the United States really decided that it was better to have a uniform set of rules that they could all follow uh, to address air and water pollution and, and other forms, rather than have to continue to deal with this onslaught of local responses that they found extremely troubling. I think there are important lessons for that for our own movement. And then very briefly, uh, before I wrap up, to just mention that we've seen a proliferation of local climate measures in cities and towns all over the world. And here in the US, in the midst of one of the most reactionary national administrations uh, any of us can remember, we've had cities pioneer uh, protections for immigrants in the form of sanctuary cities efforts to raise minimum wages and implement various kinds of environmental protections in defiance of uh, measures imposed from above. I'll conclude by pointing out that in the current movement, uh, we're seeing a proliferation of new forms of mutual aid and cooperation in cities and towns and communities all around the world. Here in North America, we have a new network of local municipal efforts to build direct democracy that's called symbiosis, uh, based on the, of course, the biological analogy uh, that's crucially important. Uh, you can look at their website, it's symbiosis-revolution.org, and that network and several others uh, have been trying to see how we take the, the current moment and not only work to meet the basic needs of people in our communities whose needs are not being met by the dominant system, but also look forward and see that as current structures prove increasingly incapable of meeting people's needs, we can develop participatory grassroots directly democratic structures from below that can eventually supplant that system. And hopefully before too long, begin to point the way toward a freer, more ecologically sound way of life for all of us here on earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And I think we can certainly come back in the discussion to some of these initiatives you're all involved in. Um, excellent. Now I propose, uh, uh -huh, Gideon has his hand raised up. I think he's very, 
uh, your mic is turned off. I was clapping. Ah, ah, okay. I don't know how to take it off now, but yeah. Oh well. <laughs> Excellent. Never mind, it'll have to stay up there. It goes away eventually, just let, oh, it, okay. let it be. Um, okay, so are, you, are you ready for me? Yeah, I think we are. You're gonna share with us the. Yeah, I, I will. I'll just yeah. I'll just introduce myself first, and then yeah. I'll for the Great. slides to share. So um, thank you, Rock, for inviting me. This is quite an amazing reunion between me, Brian, and Dan. We, you know, as, as Dan said, we go back to the Institute for Social Ecology, where I was in the late 1980s, early 90s. And that, um, after that, I had quite a long association with um, uh, Murray Bookchin. I worked with him for a number of years in various ways. And I've kind of um, been carrying that with me ever since. And um, it's, it's really um, informed everything I've done since then. Um, in more recent years, I've found my way into design as a way of thinking about large scale social change. Um, and I, I got a PhD in design, which specifically um, looked at that question as how can you use design to, to help bring about radical social, political, um, structural change. So um, I'll just try and share my screen now. Bear with me for a second. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah, working great. And let me just test it moving forward. That moves forward. I sometimes have that problem. So I want to talk um, about the emerging concept of cosmopolitan localism. Um, it's a very important strand in a new field of design, transition design. There's a small group of us have been developing in the School of Design and one or two other places around the world at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. The transition design seeks to use design tools, processes and methods to achieve um, large scale um, systems level change and it asks how design can help transition entire societies towards more sustainable, convivial, equitable, participatory and emancipatory futures. But we use the term design and designers in the broader sense to describe not simply professional design and designers but the quest uh, in Herbert Simon's words to change existing conditions into preferred ones. And we take, we, we, we called it transition design to align ourselves with the proliferation of, of movements and networks around the world who use the concept of design, of transition to describe the process, the movement from where we are now to a more desirable future. So it's the transition town movement. Or, um, the Commons Transition Network, the socio-technical transition groups in Northern Europe, um, Rapid Transition Alliance, the, the Just Transition uh, Network, and so on. And, and also, we ally ourselves very closely with various um, systems change networks that are thinking along the same lines. So transition design grows out of a trend in design to address ever broader systems issues, problems of increasing complexity that require the engagement of multiple specialisms, not just designers, multiple stakeholders from different social sectors and grassroots communities. Um, this is the transition design framework, which we use as a way of uh, organizing how we think about transition design, how we navigate the very wide range of scholarship and research from outside of design that we draw on. And there are four interrelating, mutually constituting areas that we focus on. Uh, posture and mindset, theories of change, 
visions and new ways of designing. And in a few weeks, um, Terry Irwin, um, who is also at Carnegie Mellon, is going to be giving a broader view of transition design. So I, I, I won't give you an overview here, but I want to focus my attention on one particular area of interest, which has been, which has been called cosmopolitan localism. And that connects very directly to um, what uh, Brian and Dan have been discussing. And cosmopolitan sits in the vision section of the framework. Uh, it represents a vision, the vision of the future societies towards which transition design aspires. My way of thinking about cosmopolitan localism can really be traced back to my time at the Institute for Social Ecology many years ago with, with um, uh, Dan, Brian, and um, the eco-philosopher Murray Bookchin. So the term cosmopolitan localism was coined by the eco-sociologist Wolfgang Sachs and he defined it as a system through which the biophysical integrity of the planet, hold it, I'm just going to have to adjust my screen here. Well, maybe I can't, whoops. The biophysical integrity of the planet as a whole is the mutual responsibility of localized communities rather than technocratic regimes and international agencies. For centuries, universalism has been at war with um, diversity, an innumerable variety of communities with their language, customs, cosmologies have been the losers. He calls this a process of cultural evaporation. And he argues that, that each culture should be allowed to actualize, actualize its image, particular image of the good society. But to do this in ways that don't undermine other localized good societies the, um, or, or don't undermine the possibility of planetary cohabitation. So um, most, I would argue that most grassroots green activism or activism that seeks to develop alternatives to capitalism focus on localism. And the argument being that by producing for themselves as many goods and services as is reasonably possible, communities can develop a better quality of life and reinvigorate local culture, minimize their environmental impact. But as Murray Bookchin and others spent years arguing, it's not, it's not possible to address the kinds of problems that need to be addressed through localism alone. Localities need to share resources and skills through confederated structures, and localization is a structure that's likely to lead us down a very parochial and possibly isolationist road. So in recent decades, um, philosophies of cosmopolitanism in response to globalization, westernization, colonialism of various kinds has been increasingly defined as a concern for the ethical, political, cultural and societal implications of the encounter between different peoples and cultures on equal terms. And it asks how might new ways of being in the world emerge out of such, uh, such encounters. So Gerard Delanti, the political philosopher Gerard Delanti, argues that the cosmopolitan Imagination occurs whenever new relations between self, other, and world develop in moments of no openness. A reframing of identities uh, and, uh, or loyalties um, and self-understanding in ways that have no clear direction. So cosmopolitan localism seeks to integrate um, uh, localism and cosmopolitanism in order to uh, make up for the, if you like, the, the, the weaknesses in each. So localism focuses on questions about the satisfaction of needs and self-reliance, the creation of community, living in place in, and, and in bioregions, and in bioregionalism. Um, cosmopolitanism focuses on questions about otherness and diversity, about our common humanity, about how we share knowledge and skills and resources about the co-evolution of cultures and communities, and in general about the cohabitation and coll our collective responsibility for the well-being of the planet, Gaia. Um, so, as I said, my way of thinking about cosmopolitan localism can be traced back to my time at the Institute for Social Ecology, 
but even more broadly, it can be located in the tradition of what I've called um, radical holism. Um, I have to apologize for the overwhelmingly white male um, panorama here, but um, that is, that's a historical problem which we have to deal with. Um, so, but in any case, it doesn't take away from the message. The radical holists were various type stripes of non-authoritarian non -authoritarian thinkers who in different ways all look to the natural world, to ecology, to the organic, to living systems theory, to scaffold their societal critique and, the, and to scaffold their non-hierarchical um, and emancipatory social and political outlooks. They all believed in the capacity of human beings to cooperatively organize their own lives from within their own communities and all believed that top-down and centralized institutions generally impeded rather than aided this process. So the choice of metaphor here, the metaphor of the organic, of society as a living, uh, self-creating entity is hugely significant. Um, the cognitive psychologist George Lakoff argues that our ordinary conceptual system in terms of which we both think and act is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. Metaphor is a major and indispensable part of our ordinary conventional way of conceptualizing the world. Our everyday behavior reflects our metaphorical understanding of experience. It's a system of metaphor that structures our everyday conceptual system including the most abstract concepts that lie behind much of everyday language. As soon as one gets away from concrete physical experience and starts talking about abstractions or emotions, metaphorical understanding is the norm. So some, some much earlier, the um, sociologist and political philosopher argued um, in his book, The Fundamental Forms of Social Thought, that concepts of the organic and the mechanistic have been ongoingly competing metaphors, uh, at least in Western culture, um, through which Western thought has oriented itself. And that dichotomy has really shaped how we think about uh, social, political, anthropological, and uh, economic ideologies and structures. So coming back to the radical holists, um, to take uh, Lewis Mumford as, as an example, he argued that at certain moments in history and particularly in the era of industrial capitalism, mechanistic ways of thinking and structuring society have been elevated to the detriment of both the natural world and what he called organic communities and organic social structures, what he called the mega machine, established predictable behavior and remote control from the center by transferring autonomy from each individual member and group to the organized whole in which they would function only as obedient machine-like parts. And then with the industrial capitalist revolution, he says purely mechanical forms were superimposed upon every manifestation of life. Take another example, um, the philosopher Martin Buber argued that the organic structure of society or its cell tish, cellular tissue has, was being hollowed out by capitalism. Um, under capitalist society, oh, sorry, under capitalist economy in the state peculiar to the constitution of society, was, uh, it, it was continually being hollowed out so that the modern individualizing process finished up as a process of atomization. Um, remember the term hollowing out. We'll come back to that. It's a key concept within this discourse um, that it's a key term that, that keeps being used. And um, I'm particularly interested in unpacking what it means, what the concept of hollowing out in the, uh, means. So again, coming back to Murray Bookchin, his historical narrative, to simplify it a little bit, for purposes of this discussion, was based on the argument that hierarchies of all kinds had destroyed organic communities and organic social forms. And he argued that we need to recover a new form of organic society, a society based on ecological principles, an organic society within which the splits within society, between society and nature, and within the human psyche that were created by thousands of years of hierarchical development can be healed and transcended.
either we will create an ecotopia, ecotopia based on ecological principles, or we will simply go under as a species. So cosmopolitan localism represents the re-emergence of the social and political and technological paradigm that's the ones organicist or ecological, if you prefer, and emancipatory. Um, and it can be thought of as the social and political and economic institutionalization of the principles of contemporary and uh, chaos and complexity theory, which I think is the most uh, scientifically rigorous and well articulated contemporary version of our understanding of what of ecology really and and what and therefore what organicism means and it demonstrates that natural systems are self-organizing emergent participatory and that's the language of social ecology used to describe the natural world really um, uh, Margaret Wheatley says, order emerges as elements of the system work together, discovering, uh, discovering each other and together inventing new capacities. Um, so chaos and complexity theory also show how natural systems are not only self-organizing, but they're multi-scalar, they're nested, um, networked webs of relationships. So thinking metaphorically, the organization of natural systems are analogous to the organization of the different levels of scale of everyday life in what Buber, Mumford, Bookchin, uh, Jane Jacobs, and so on would have broadly described as organic societies. And that nested organic pattern represents the basic and more or less universal structure of everyday life in traditional societies. And you can see how the nature of uh, the nature of the interrelationships uh, or, and the nature, therefore the nature of everyday life shifts as you move up and down the levels of scale. And that, that um, accordingly reflects the different qualities of everyday life at each level of scale. So, and those complex networks of everyday life that come into being at each level of scale are formed as people uh, go about their everyday life satisfying their needs. So the fabric of everyday life is woven as people strive to satisfy their needs. Uh, behind this idea, there's a, there's a body of work, primarily by Manfred Max Neef, on the relationship between needs and satisfiers. We haven't really got time to go into that there, but um, maybe later we could talk about it. So um, what happens in modern society is that the fabric of everyday life, the social fabric, begins to disintegrate as the satisfiers for needs are appropriated by centralized and centralizing institutions. So the domains of everyday life, the different levels of scale, the household, the neighborhood, the city, and so on, as mutualistic, self-organizing, unified, semi-autonomous whole forms are hollowed out and begin to fragment. And as I've said, Buber, Bookchin, and others frequently use the expression hollowed out to describe the condition of the social fabric in capitalist society. So if we can apply, apply contemporary uh, organic metaphor to their argument, this is what the hollowing of society looks out, uh, looks like. Um, uh, it, uh, as as the, the control of the process of need satisfaction is seeded, um, everyday life begins to fragment and homogenize and that in turn leads to multiple ecological, social, economic and political issues from which everyday life is suffering all over the world. Um, so, and it's addressing those kinds of wicked problems from the loss of biodiversity to poverty and, and inequity, from institutionalized racism to air pollution, from lack of access to healthy food to deforestation that are the central focus of transition design. So transition design argues that we need to help communities reappropriate satisfiers through multiple ecologies of interventions at all levels of scale of everyday life over short, medium and long horizons of time to help households, neighborhoods, cities and regions become dynamic, self-organizing forms that strike a balance between autonomy and interdependence. So this is a kind of bird's eye view of a cosmopolitan localist society in which everyday life has been reconstituted at different levels of scale 
through the recovery of communities' abilities to satisfy their needs at each of these. Everyday life is nested, networked, self-organized through mutualistic relationships between people, nature, and the artifacts. Uh, and artifacts. Um, interdependence exists at multiple levels of scale. Um, each, uh, um, each of those interdependencies represents a kind of a symbiotic relationship to uh, go back to what Brian was saying. Neighborhoods are engaged with other neighborhoods and the city at large. Cities network and confederate with one another and so on, forming dense, holarchic uh, webs of, and diverse webs of interdependence. That, that densely woven fabric can arise because communities have been empowered to take control of the satisfaction of their needs. So communities have been relocalized, but at multiple interconnecting levels of scale from the household to the planet. Uh, that's a kind of sideways look at cosmopolitan localism, multi-directional, multi-scalar, symbiotic networking of everyday life, decentralized and self-organized system in which social and political power is distributed throughout rather than concentrated on particular places. So cosmopolitan localism is an alternative to globalization based on the metaphor of society as an organism. It's a theory of inter-regional and planet-wide cooperative networking between decentralized, place-based, self-organizing and participatory communities that are in control of the satisfaction of their needs at all levels of scale of everyday life, household, neighborhood, city, region and planet, and that share collective responsibility for the societal well-being and for the bi biophysical integrity of the planet. Um, I'll just flash through these questions very quickly. These are the kinds of big questions that need answering around cosmopolitan localism. Um, which as yet, well, we've got a lot of work to do on them. Um, this is the uh, Transition Design uh, Seminar website, if you're interested in following this up. There's a lot of information, some information about cosmopolitan localism, but a lot more about transition design generally. Thank you. I'll de-share the screen now, if I can manage. Um, Excellent, Gideon. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, yeah, I've been following the transition design uh, stuff ever since, like in, in the 2005-15, I think, was the was the transition design monograph. It really got me thinking about these connections personally, also between theories of change and, and futures methods, and alternative economics, among other things. I think it's really wonderful to have, have all of you here today with kind of this common genealogy, genealogy and, and kind of uh, developing in, into all these exciting spheres and, and applying them to, to different spheres. Um, maybe at this point, yeah, uh, thank you also for, for all the resources that you've kind of linked here in your presentations. We're also happy to collect this and, and, and give to people who are interested. And, and I, I would also encourage people, yeah, to check out the uh, this also, if I understood right, the Social Ecology Institute is having a running a webinar series as well. And, and the transition design, I think, is kind of like in, in the open source, uh, like uh, uh, teaching, right? All the, all the materials are available openly and We're such. To... So I think these are excellent resources for our movement and broader to, to really think through uh, strategies and so on through that. Um, maybe just I would say also that uh, through our Facebook event and a post on on Mladiza Podnemna Pravichnost, people can also submit their own questions. Uh, but now for the moment, uh, I would maybe I have two questions prepared that I want to interweave uh, kind of all of your thoughts around. Um, and the first one would be like positioning utopia and utopian thinking. Um, also, maybe but the the theory and the imaginary. Um, and I was thinking maybe Brian, you, you could think of utopia as strategy and, and and speculative design and fiction, participatory futures, and these kinds of 
uh, tools uh, to kind of bring utopias or heterotopias or eutopias or however or, or critical dystopias um, and how that's part of, of the strategy. And maybe Dan could begin with, with a little reflection uh, uh, on the, uh, I think you're uh, muted. Yes. Well, utopian thinking is an essential part of social ecology. It's really, uh, social ecology operates on three time frames. We, we look at the past, the deep past, the evolution of natural history. We look at contemporary society with a critical eye. We try to understand both the limitations and the potentialities. And then understanding those potentialities, we think about the future and we do it in a way that's really, I think, quite different from the way the future is considered in most academic disciplines, in the sense that we are unabashedly utopian. We think in terms of what could be and what should be, while most thinking about the future is simply a projection of what is into the future, you know, peak oil or systems theory, et cetera, et cetera. So social ecology is a departure from that. And it's vitally important because uh, first of all, utopian thinking has to be rooted in real existing possibilities. It should reflect the kinds of principles that social ecology has teased out of our understanding from the natural world. If our utopian vision is one of an ecological society, if it's a vision of a reharmonization of people and nature, those principles are essential. They have to inform our vision for the future. And as you suggested, Rock, I, I think from perspective of social ecology, we're not talking about a single homogenized, universalized utopian vision. Rather, we're thinking about a multiplicity of utopias that will emerge from the particular experience, history, culture, and traditions of individual communities. But those experiences and traditions have to be framed within the context of these basic principles and then the actual design process, which Gideon I think laid out for us beautifully is one that will emerge in different ways in different places. You know, historically, the word utopia was coined by Sir Thomas Moore in 1515. He said it had two roots, both from the ancient Greek. The first, the word autopia, which means no place. The second, the word utopia, which means utopia is the Greek pronunciation. I've been corrected by my Greek friends in the past, uh, is the good place. And it's clearly that vision of the good place that social ecology relates to, but it has to be a good place anchored in reality. It can't fly off into cloud cuckoo land. It can't be like Fourier's notion that the seas will turn to lemonade. Though of course with the acidification of the oceans going on because of global warming, they may turn to lemonade at some point not lemonade, obviously. So utopian thinking is important, I think, for several reasons. First, as these individual community-based participatory visions of utopia emerge, they provide inspiration for people. They give them a sense that things, in fact, can be different. And I think it's crucial that we develop that kind of imaginary. It's, it's in fact, something which has largely been lost in more traditional kind of Marxist approaches. Uh, it's, it's a very limited view. And here we have the opportunity to really think in a much more broad and, and bold fashion. So that's very important as a point of inspiration. They're also very important as a point of orientation, because I think we all feel a certain urgency to act. And act is, action is extremely important. We need to protest. We need to create alternatives. We need to do all of that, but we need to do it in a very self-conscious way that's oriented in a particular direction. And that direction has to be informed by our principles. Simply acting without understanding the basis for our action, without having a point towards which we are moving can actually take us in a very wrong direction. And unfortunately, I think we've seen this in certain tendencies in the ecology movement, uh, you know, where we see the green anarchist or anarcho primitivist movement suggesting certainly major changes in society, but changes that per personally I find horrifying the idea that we would all become hunters and gatherers, for example. 
and totally unrealistic unless you're willing to look at massive population reductions around the world and take draconian measures to ensure that. So this utopian vision then helps us orient the little actions, the, the incremental steps that we're taking today and make sure that they're steps that are leading us in the right direction. And I think also that utopian thinking is a way of transcending the given. And that's important because the given, what, the mess that we find ourselves in the midst of today can easily become overwhelming, can easily lead to nihilism or inaction. People feel paralyzed. And once again, that notion of utopia, that notion that we can systematically move towards a qualitatively different future uh, is extremely important. And, and those are some of the reasons I think that a utopian vision, utopian thinking is of vital importance. And I would also suggest that the kinds of changes that we're in the midst of are, are in large part an educational process that we need to educate ourselves and we need to educate others as to what the contours of an ecological society might look like. And that process of education occurs in very different ways with different people. Some people will take a, a course or study for a PhD and become inspired by that. Others will participate in a protest march and that's a form of education as well or a community organizing effort and that's a form of education. Other people will be inspired by a, by a piece of music or a work of art or a, a work of literature, uh, a story. And that utopian consciousness, that utopian sensibility that can inform those other educational efforts uh, I also think is really important. And, and you see that, you know, you, I often encounter people, students who have said, oh, I read a novel by Ursula Le Guin and that really turned me on to this whole way of thinking. Or, or uh, you know, I saw a movie that suggested that things might be different. So, so the point being, there's no single point of entry into this process of change. People will come at it from different directions with different experiences and different perspectives. And certainly that utopian sensibility can inform many of those educational media that we see being so important in changing people's minds. And that educational process is ongoing. It's underway already. I believe that there are millions and millions of people around the world who embrace the ideas that we've discussed today and are developing in their own communities through participatory and democratic processes, their own uniquely utopian visions. And it's, I think, an, an essential part of the process of change that we have to be inspired by our, our highest aspirations and not be willing to settle for our, the lowest common denominator. So I, I thanks, believe that. Thanks so much, Dan. Maybe I'd give the word to Gideon to have his own take and, and also, of course, Brian, I think we're back online. Uh, Gideon, your mic. I just didn't want everyone to hear me shuffling around. So. Um, thanks. I, well, what um, Dan was saying reminded me of my slight frustration with the Occupy uh, movement. And it's, I don't know what it was that prevented people from like using that moment to, or being bold enough and not being inhibited from discussing radical alternatives. And I, I, I think that was one of the reasons it petered out, petered out um, the, way, the way in which it did. So yeah, just to uh, reiterate what, what Dan was saying, I mean, we, um, we, we need to, I mean, we've also been, um, I think, enslaved to this idea, this idea that the Tina argument, there is no alternative, which was coined by Margaret Thatcher about, probably about 30 years ago now. So, so we've become so um, embedded um, in our way of 
organizing our societal systems that we simply can't see any alternatives. We can't see, you know, we can't look over the horizon. And I think that's the, that's the function of, that's the critical function of utopianism. And the other thing I was thinking about is, um, historically utopianism has been its own worst enemy in a way because the vast majority of uh, utopias and uh, overtly utopian thinkers have been kind of authoritarian, totalitarian, beginning with Plato. Um, there have been, there's been a much more interesting, uh, but much less prominent strand of non-authoritarian utopian thinking. So I think we need to make um, a very uh, clear distinction between between the kinds of utopia thinking that we're doing. Um, and uh, as far as transition design is concerned, uh, I would like the way um, futuring is, is a big part of transition design and it takes that from design, uh, the discourse of design really, but it's um, the way futuring has developed historically has been kind of apolitical, I would say, um, and it has been, it has been primarily to serve the needs of, of of companies, large corporations to see, determine how they're going to develop. And I think it has, finds it very difficult, it's found it very difficult to shake off that history. And it, so it always has this agnostic, I would say, futurism on futuring as we know it is agnostic and I would very much like to inject a much more critical utopian dimension into the way we think about um, the visioning and futuring and transition design. I'm a little bit frustrated by that, by, by futuring's inability to commit and inability to, to, take, a critical pers to take a critical perspective. Thanks so much, Gideon. Uh, well, lots of ideas are coming up, but maybe I'll give Brian uh, the word also if you have some reflections on utopia or also the social movement question that Gideon brought up. Yes, I'll be very brief because I think Dan really touched on the most fundamental points. Um, in the climate movement, of course, there's a tendency to focus on uh, very dystopian outlooks on what the future could look like. And certainly in a time like right now, facing this global pandemic, our screens are filled every day with just horrific images of what's happening around the world. And those of us who have been engaged in uh, climate work over the last 10 years uh, see those all the time. And uh, the future has the potential to be extremely dire. On the other hand, I think uh, people move forward and movements move forward when uh, most effectively when we're able to think beyond the worst case scenarios and begin to envision as, as both Dan and Gideon have described uh, the kind of future that we want that meets our fullest, uh, that realizes our fullest potentialities for uh, a, a genuinely free and genuinely ecological human future. Um, the, the record of movements acting on those impulses rather than trying to shock people into uh, seeing how bad things can get is definitely uneven. Um, but I think people get tired and worn down and uh, paralyzed even by uh, a continuing focus on the most dire possibilities. In the case of Occupy Wall Street, I think it began with uh, a very, uh, very much of a, of a long range outlook on rebuilding a different kind of future. 
and the kinds of presentations and the kinds of conversations that people were having in during that movement really all around the world reflected that. But what happened was over time, the, the increasing pressure, uh, both in terms of political repression and in terms of sustaining uh, people living on the street for periods of weeks, uh, took its toll and it became increasingly difficult to sustain that focus. But I think that movement at its best, as well as all of the movements that I described at their best, uh, really were, were able to think beyond the current emergency while being completely focused on what's needed to address the current emergency, but also thinking beyond it toward a, a vision of a different kind of world. And I'll end with one of my favorite quotes of, of all time from the uh, Italian anarchist militant of the early 20th century, Enrico Malatesta, who said, everything depends on what the people are capable of wanting. And I think that is as true now as it was 100 years ago, and maybe even more so. Yeah, I, I also love that quote, Brian. Mm -hmm. And I'll put out another quote, which is uh, from Murray Bookchin, and actually a modification of, of graffiti that was written on the walls of Nanterre University during the May-June events in France in 1968, where they said, uh, be realistic, do the impossible. To which Bookchin added, if we don't do the impossible, we face the unthinkable. So absolutely, that comes out rather well. Uh, speaking of utopias, I was also reminded of the real utopias framework by Eric Allen Wright and, and how you know, the kind of prefigurative experiments and how those uh, are considered like in some ways utopias. And, and he was thinking through of the different strategies and, and built this framework. It's also a kind of theory of change, I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar. Uh, but maybe just I uh, wanted to share with you like an initiative we're kind of starting up in, in terms of like active production of futures. Um, and, and then we would move on to the next question, which is also from the Q&A. And then I think it's about time that, that we wrap up in about 10 minutes. Um, so the idea that we're working it with or I'm developing with some colleagues here in the movement is the so-called Four Futures Festival. Uh, so it takes as a point of departure Jim Dater's Four Futures framework of like, you know, uh, growth, collapse, uh, transformation, um, and another one that's slipping my mind at the moment. Um, but essentially uh, the idea is to run a whole series of workshops with, with different peoples and in a kind of, you know, horizontal deliberative process, creative process, um, come up uh, with, like um, speculative designs or, or narratives or um, am I still online? Okay, I, I thought I thought I was uh, frozen. I think I have Brian's image frozen here in front of me. Um, uh, so to run this series of workshops to produ produce both critical like growth futures uh, to like completely transformed, let's say, utopian futures and create, you know, different dialogues, different like speculative objects to put in this space and to basically organize at the end of this process a festival where, where people can enter these spaces, these four futures um, and kind of interact with people and, and kind of relativize this, you know, uh, one way path to a future, but really opening up uh, the plurality of futures and, and our own agency and say, and what kind of futures come about. Mm. Uh, so to, uh, add, yeah, maybe uh, to- That's really interesting. It I'll really be ha does. happy to share the ideas and, and things and, and work through things together and experiment. Uh, there's also the idea to kind of share these designs or ideas for these scenarios openly on a global platform so that people could share, comment, iterate, and so on. The kind of global commons effort or a foresight commons as, as some people uh, have framed it. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth noting that really in its most profound utopia will never be achieved. It'll continually recede to the horizon and it's aspirational. It's, that's a point that Lewis Mumford made very well in his little book, The Story of Utopias. Uh, it's a point of orientation rather than a place where we can actually arrive. Exactly, yeah. And also the pluriversality and the heterotopicity or, or however we were talking about the, the legitimate different ways of knowing being knowing. which are kind of intertwined on this common planet. Mm. So maybe we go to the second question. It was actually also one of my pre-prepared questions. It kind of intersects with uh, what uh, one of our listeners is interested in. Uh, so he frames it as uh, what are the main economic theories or models which underpin the field of social ecology? And I myself was also very interested in your takes. Um, I know also from the transitions design side, uh, like participatory economics or PARICON was, was one of the big, but I'd be really eager to hear from all of you, yeah, and the kind of uh, fluxes of, of different theories and models that, that came came through when you're thinking sure. well I, I think that social ecology's economics have been informed once again by a utopian perspective and by our understanding of the natural world and the way natural processes happen one of the most important elements one of the most important tendencies in nature that social ecology identifies is mutualism, interdependence, and a kind of ethos of caring and sharing. And that is ultimately what informs social ecology's economics. We seek an economics which is framed in terms of from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And it's informed in part by our understanding of anthropology, the fact that for almost the whole of human history, people functioned using economic systems that were not market-based, that were based rather uh, initially on a system of gift giving that uh, Karl Polanyi called a uh, reciprocal economy, the understanding that you gave a gift and at some point that gift would return to you, but there was no accounting, there was no, I gave you an antelope leg yesterday, so you owe me an antelope leg tomorrow. It's just the understanding that these things were necessary for the survival of all. And it was that community ethos that informed caring and sharing. And then even as hierarchical society emerged, we still saw in peasant society a redistributive economy, even incipient early true hierarchies, kingships, etc. cetera, uh, you know, the ruler played a redistributive role. So there's a long history of cooperative mutualistic economics that social ecology thinks is an essential part of our human legacy. And it's not that we would return to those systems, that we, we would return to the economics of hunters and gatherers, but rather that those represent a principle that could be dialectically transformed and applied in the present. And social ecology also sees combining that ethos of caring and sharing through the creation of um, municipalism, the creation of municipalization of economic relationships based in community, based in certainly degrees of trade and exchange, but emphasizing the to the highest degree possible, the self-reliance of each locality and each community. And social ecology is also informed by a post-scarcity ethos because we don't reject technology. We think you have to critically examine technology and certainly there are technologies that are inherently destructive, inherently evil, I would suggest that we don't wanna become involved with. But early in the 1970s uh, back at the Institute, we were experimenting and promoting solar technology and wind technology, ecological forms of food production, biological agriculture, ecological aquaculture. And we were doing that because we saw that they had the potential to be applied in the context of local communities. They could be owned and controlled and understood by people that don't require a huge 
industrial, in, centralized industrial fossil fueled infrastructure. So it's a combination of that new ethos and some of these new technologies that could allow for us to actualize the post-scarcity potential that already exists in society today. You know, we've, we're throwing away 40% of all of the food produced in the world every day. Tremendous waste, tremendous profiteering, tremendous ego involved in current economic relationships, and that can be transformed. And there are precedents, there are models that we can look at, and there are historical and anthropological precedents that we can draw inspiration from. But once again, I think the particular economics of each community are going to be dependent on their particular situation, but certainly need to be informed by the principle of mutualism, the notion of municipalization, and the concept of post-scarcity. So. Thanks so much, Dan. I'll invite Gideon and Brian to maybe also, uh, but maybe let's keep it brief since we're, I, I suppose, at this point a little bit over time, although it's, it's all fine from our end. Can I go first or? or? Um, sure. So, yeah, I mean, I just, just to, um, again, my thinking about economics has, has always been you know, shaped by social ecology. Um, I think you know, everything that Murray Bookchin was arguing about the potentialities for a kind of decentralized technology in the 1960s is a hundred times more true now with the possibilities for developing an entirely new kind of uh, socio-technical infrastructure which is which is which, which is not centralized which is uh, can be managed from a neighborhood or municipal level and controlled from a, from a neighborhood mini so the potentialities for that are ever greater you know with every year um, the second thing was that I'm, I've also always come back to Bookchin's notion of the municipalization of the economy and making, you know, the 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 putting municipalities uh, in control um, of of the you know the, the key aspects of the economic in infrastructure um, and managing that through a process of participatory citizen democracy. And the third the the, the third thing was an idea of that Bookchin used to talk about a lot was the idea of the irreducible minimum, so that regardless of an individual's contribution to society, regardless of their social status, um, they have the, everyone has the right to, to a, a core, to satisfy their, their core needs and the core needs of you know, food, shelter, um, basic needs and that's just that that's fundamental and not negotiable i'll add that uh, another concept that that really comes from carl polanyi's work is the notion of re-embedding the economy in society uh under capitalism we tend to accept the notion that the economy is an independent sphere that dominates social relationships. And we really want to turn that on its head. Uh, we view <clears throat> the municipality as a self-governing entity. Uh, we seek to reclaim politics as the self-management of the community, of the polis, uh, using the, going back to the Greek roots of the word politics. And uh, local economies become an expression of our local direct democracy. And that's what we really mean by uh, municipalization. And around the world in the last 10 years, as people have come to see the failure of the neoliberal model of rampant privatization of the public sphere, we've seen many examples, particularly in uh, the energy sphere in Germany, but in water politics and many other areas, where essential public services have been reabsorbed into the municipal sphere. And that's very much resonant with uh, 
social ecology's visions of municipalizing the economy. We need to abolish the tyranny of the market and evolve in every possible way uh, toward uh, economies of mutual aid and reciprocity and uh, the highest aspiration as, as Dan mentioned is the, is, is the gift economy is really the ultimate goal. Thanks so much. And, and the last two points that were kind of also going into direction of yeah, all, the, the whole discussions around alternative welfare systems and such we here, I think we're really trying to think through and I think this uh, perspective is will also be very key in thinking through like basic services provisioning uh, systems that you know are, are organized based on cooperative principles and but but then the whole political challenge so to say of of um, what um, Ariel said in, in our last talk of this negotiation uh, between state market and, and commons as, or, or this renegotiation of the commons yeah, the commons is a, another really crucial concept that we've not touched on, but very much mm. central to how we think about these issues. Bookchin often framed it in terms of the need for a moral economy. Yes. As opposed mm. to a monetary economy. So I think that about wraps it up for today. Um, I should maybe also mention that um, uh, we weren't unable, but we were uh, we were planning to host this stream also on the global 24-hour stream um, of the Fridays for Future International Initiative. Uh, we had some technical difficulties connecting, so uh, we thought the first hour of the lectures would be part of that. Um, but we will be sure to uh, share this link on the platform as well, and people can can look back uh, to to this session. Mm. Uh, Rock, be before we go, can I just encourage people, if they're interested in pursuing these ideas, to check out the Institute for Social Ecology website, which is social-ecology.org. For sure. And we have many online classes, uh, as well as resources that can be accessed directly from the website. Uh, so please check us out. Excellent. I think 